Hello, welcome to a new episode of B3 In Depth. My name is Johannes Grenzfurtner. I'm an artist and researcher and writer and performer. I founded an art and technology group called Monochrome some 30 odd years ago. And uh, at some point, the B3 and Monochrome met and we fell in love and they invited me to be the official host of the B3 in-depth uh, videocast series. And uh, I enjoy it very much. And uh, why do I enjoy it? Because I have wonderful and great guests I can talk to. And uh, uh, a big virtual applause now for our new guest, uh, Julie Carpenter sitting over there in her living room in San Francisco, I suppose. Yeah, pretty much, that's right. And, and I am in San Francisco, right downtown. Nice, so uh, for all of you out there who don't know what Julie's doing, so she is an interdisciplinary researcher and she's primarily known for her work in uh, the field of human machine interaction. But interestingly, as a cultural scholar, uh, she uh, she made her PhD in educational psychology, which is very interesting uh, for the B3 uh, audience. And of course, uh, one of her uh, big themes also is film theory. And how all of that fits together, uh, we're trying to uh, like dig right into it. And uh, uh, just like starting with the film aspect of your research and leading into uh, the more uh, human machine interaction discussions. So what are your favorite films that depict some kind of great human machine interaction, be it deadly, be it humorous, be it uh, funny, just yeah. like uh, Tell Blade us. Runner. I gotta say Blade Runner. I'm gonna say Blade Runner and not only the original Blade Runner, mm -hmm. thank you very much. The director's cut, to be even more specific um, and nerdy about it. The one but, with the unicorn. Uh, yes. And I think that the, the one without the voiceover at the mm -hmm. end, without the happy ending, uh, yeah. where you just get to, to figure it out for yourself. And um, yeah, Blade Runner, I have to say, is far, it, it's such a favorite of mine. It inspired me before there was really even a formal field called human robot interaction. When I was still a film, gosh, I saw it before I was even a film theory undergrad, because that's how long ago it came out. And I remember writing an essay about it, actually dissecting the, all the religious symbolism mm -hmm. in it, because there's a lot of Christian, uh, faith-based religious symbolism throughout the movie. And eventually I became a film theory undergraduate, like you said, And to but to this day, that film, I put it on even when I'm writing. It's, it's still, it, Ridley Scott is such an amazing built world builder. And uh, of course the, the story um, itself, it, it, you know, it raises so many interesting ethical questions but he he took the the short story and and made it his own thing in a very different medium right between writing and film it's inspirational oh. yeah. it, it has one of the best openings in film history the scene where they administer the the void uh test to find out if this character is a robot or not a replicant or not i mean of course you you don't know that in uh, in the plot already, but it's so perfectly built, I think. At one point, I, I remember, I always wanted to make a new cut of that film. And in the meantime, it's uh, completely easy to do that, where at some point, uh, the replicant just like shoves over like, you know, like a couple of hundred dollars and leaves. So you can oh, like, bri bri be... bribes the cop and the film is over. Yeah. <laughs> That would show how human he was, wouldn't it? That would demonstrate yes. that he understood, or at least that he was more human-like. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are just so many ways that that story can go in your head. And, you know, that's one of the interesting things about film or storytelling or narrative in general, right, is that you change even though the finished product doesn't. So you're always bringing something new to it. And of course, because my interest has been in, in human technology uh, interaction, human robot interaction, I'm always seeing new things in that film, whether Ridley Scott intended them 
to be there or not, I bring new things as, you know, a viewer with my own perspective and as a perspective of that film that's changed over time as technology has changed and cultures have changed. So it, it's a film that in my brain, I keep regenerating the story so I can keep revisiting it. To me, it's just, but, and I also liked um, Her, which is, you know, of course about more human computer interaction. She's disembodied. It's a romance, if you will, um, uh, that asks a lot of questions about human machine attachment, human computer love, human compute, human human right? Uh, interactions, because really that's what all of this is about, is seeing ourselves through this funhouse mirror of the technology that we invent. And I think that that was a very good, more recent movie that grapples with some of the things that are we're discovering right now, you know, about um, that people can become attached uh, at, at different levels, whether it's romantic or in a friendly way, to um, a completely artificial medium. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes it can be uh, a useful tool. It can be almost therapeutic. It can be therapeutic, I believe. Um, we see that manifest in, in different ways. So um, in real life, not just science fiction. And of course, the best part about science fiction or, you know, to me is um, just the, the cyclical nature that, you know, real life things like real inventions that are coming down the way and real emerging technologies influence the science fiction authors and, and artists and directors and filmmakers. And, and, uh, and then that influences our expectations about how we're going to interact with these technologies. So for example, and, and this showed up in my own work, uh, especially the defense oriented work I did, I was surprised when people, well not surprised, but um, it was interesting to me that you know, people, soldiers who were highly trained to work with specific robots that didn't resemble humans or animals at all, uh, would sometimes have an expectation on how they were supposed to interact with the robot just based on science fiction, right? And, and video games also influenced them. So uh, in other words, before they had interacted with a robot in real life, their model of interaction was based on movies. And in movies, robots are often, at least in Western Hollywood movies, they're often portrayed in sort of an evil or potentially malevolent way. Things like iRobot or Terminator. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot going on there. and. Uh, Blade Runner, that's a good one. Her, that's a good one. Yeah. Nice, nice. I mean, and it, it's just uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson as the voice of 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 her. It's it's just like a wonderful, brilliant like play to just like think like what would happen if I fall in love with my operating system. Yeah. <laughs> so what what's going on? And it's it's even a, a whole story. What I what I really found interesting is that it's pretty much like a story about how humans deal with an AI that is capable of giving so much more, not only to one person. So in the end, it's a big drama because she's pretty much in love with like 5,000 customers and not only with him. So it's also in an interestingly like a story about like AI, uh, you know, polyamory, you could even call it. Yeah, well, and also I think that it sort of leads to again our our expectations. We have these, and and I'm I'm, I'm actually I am writing a whole book about this, that mm -hmm. it won't be out for a while, but about our what I call the human gaze, because we keep envisioning AI in relation to ourself, and in that way, I think we create boundaries in everything from our research and development to how we interact with it, because we are always thinking, how is it gonna help us, whether it's through art and entertainment uh, or a cultural touchstone, or whether it's uh, a tool or, you know, that's helping you in an industrial or military setting. Um, yeah, so it's a, very, it's a very complicated set of relationships. 
Yeah. So humans are pretty fast in falling in love, let's call it, with, with objects. I mean, my, my grandpa, uh, I mean, may he rest in peace, but I think my grandpa was more in love with his car than with my grandmother. Uh, and, uh, and, and the car is not even doing anything. I mean, it's just there. So he's just like projecting all his uh, like needs and wishes onto the car. But uh, at some point the car will talk back like in her. So do you think that will amplify that connection between humans and, and machines even further? <laughs> Yeah, it creates a different relationship. Even, you know, even GPS has is not so like even if the simpler GPS of like let's say 10 15 years ago where it gives you just simply instructions turn right at the next corner. That changed our interactions with cars as well, but having a much more interactive voice system like you said, you know, it, Again, I think, you know, the research and development side, people are thinking, how can we make this easier for people while they're driving? How can we make this touch free? And how can we make people comfortable learning a new technology without becoming engineers or learning new driving skills? So voice communication seems like a very good default for humans. Many of us can hear, write, and, and speak, and we understand. Our mental model for that is human-human interaction, though. That will change over time as more artificial entities learn to talk with us, applications and robots and, and vehicles. And I believe that we're going to develop different social categories, different ways of becoming attached. But yes, it does, to answer your first question, it does, I believe, impact how people interact with their vehicles and um the reason for that is because you can't sort of have it both ways you can't design something specifically to make people more comfortable in this environment and to change the driving experience so radically and then uh, not expect that it's going to have, first of all, unanticipated changes, but that if you're using a human-human model of interaction, there's going to be a cultural change period where, as you said, people have to adjust. We're learning that not everything that talks, right, uh, is necessarily as intelligent as we give it credit for. But that also doesn't stop us that knowledge that something is not necessarily intelligent, that it doesn't really know us like a human friend or acquaintance would know us, that knowledge is still in our brains. And that I have to give credit back to Nass and Reeves uh, from Stanford scholars and their computers as social actors theory from way back in the day that uh, some of my work especially with robots and human-robot interaction, I think builds on their work. And their theory at, that I feel like they proved pretty well was is very solid, is that people were treating web, especially web, and com but computer-based interactions where they were interacting with the computer, not through the computer necessarily, but with the computer in some way as a social actor similar to a human, right? And again, it's not because people are stupid. It's not necessarily, it. yes, the technology was new, but it wasn't because they didn't have an understanding of its limited functionality that was part of it. But also part of it is it's our instinct and it was a new social actor in our culture. And we, we keep introducing, I, I'm going to keep calling them social actors because mm -hmm. that's what they're attempting to be. We keep introducing these personas and these social actors that are artificial. And even though we're sort of adjusting right now, and sometimes people might become attached um, in different ways, I think that that will change over time and we'll develop different social categories because humans are great at social categories. I mean, uh, I've said this before in other interviews, you know, as examples, we, we learn to talk to people differently, right? We have different social categories. I have acquaintances, I have colleagues, you know, a, a random stranger on the street, a clerk at a store, all of these people, I present a different way of communicating, a different 
sense of self. I share a different amount, you know, personal detail with each person, depending on context. We develop social categories. I think that we'll do that similarly for all of these artificial systems that we learn to communicate, especially in a human-like or even an animal-like way. Uh, if we can treat it like a dog, for example, like, um, like an Ibo toy, right? I mean, that's an obvious one. It, it looks like a animal. It doesn't speak back to you, but it understands some verbal commands as an animal would, right? So already we have different social categories. Your expectations of interacting with Ibo, this animal-like robot are different than your expectations of any socialness with your car. And then I'm gonna get back to what you were saying about your grandfather. Um, and you know, my family is from Germany, so I'm gonna say my upa, my, my yeah. upa, <laughs> the leather <laughs> car, right? So um, yeah, so his relationship was different to his car. So yeah, he could be attached, but I would say that that would be attachment that goes, and attachment theory, to products, really that comes from consumer research that goes back a ways. People like Belk and, and stuff like that talked, um, you know, decades ago about how people could, I would categorize that more as a human product interaction mm -hmm. uh, and a human product attachment. And the reason that that's a little different is because his relationship with the car was different. He understood his power over the car, he controlled the car, right? Um, probably couldn't control your Uma, your grandmother that yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right, <laughs> good for her. So the relationship was different. It was, it was um, any negotiating he had to do with your Uma, he didn't have to do with the car, right? So it, it's a perhaps more just a fun relationship with the car. Now, as you sort of indicated, it's becoming complex in a different, because the attachment or the potential for attachment or the potential even for distraction um, as we adjust to these new, especially I think the voice systems. It, we're living in a really interesting cultural time for human technology interaction. So that's one of my really famous long winding answers to your question, so. Yeah. I wouldn't want it any other way. So <laughs> perfect. Uh, but let, let, let's go on with the voice systems because I mean there has been a lot of research about that. But uh, uh, but I'd, I'd like to connect that to to the story of my 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 oma and opa, my my grandfather and my grandmother. Uh, uh, because one thing, and of course that was a different time, and 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 uh, patriarchy in Austria in the 1950s and 60s was even stronger than than it is today but i remember that my my grandmother was never allowed to uh, to to make the driver's license so my dad uh, my granddad just didn't like that so i think that's also the connection of like power and status and control within the the family structure and all that stuff but uh what what what's interesting is is that uh the very moment you 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 have a certain kind of like embedded understanding in, in the culture, let's say a patriarchal structure as we have, yeah? Uh, you immediately associate certain things with like gender, for example, that most of the uh, navigation systems and, and the artificial voices are female because they are in a certain way, they should serve you. And that, that serving is projected onto uh, onto the female gender and stuff like that. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit about that and uh, what oh, the research I'd be about. Happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to. Uh, so you know that I, I also, I, I volunteered with uh, Vice Copenhagen to work on Q, which the, the goal of Project Q was to create a gender neutral voice for use with technology. Um, and it wasn't to solve all of you know, some of the problems that you've indicated, it was to start or to add to a global conversation about gendered technology, like you're talking about with voice systems in particular. Um, but of course, since voice can be embedded in anything, it could affect gender of robots or, or, or embodied systems as well. Um, and it was to, uh, you know, ha so people would start asking 
these questions and also to prove that it could be done and that also to sort of put out there that people are ready for a gender neutral option. So having talked about that and sort of my background in that voice and that interest in particular, it's really unfortunate that I think, um, I think that what you have talked about is unfortunately sometimes people root their reasoning for developing voice systems that are gendered is also rooted in that Reeves and Nass um, computers as social actors research from decades ago because of their misunderstanding of it. So uh, I'll, uh, let me explain what that means, what I mean by that. So there was part of their research so first of all, there's different ways you can do research. People often, when they think of scientific research, immediately their brain goes to positivist, uh, uh, observable experiments that are done, like uh, replicated thousands of times. But often in fields like psychology and human behavior, um, especially when you're first doing an inquiry into something, your route is going to be what we call more qualitative inquiries, where you're getting you're literally writing down or recording people's experiences, and then you rigorously go through all of their experiences and you look for themes that eventually you can pull out as these are patterns of what's emerging and what people are saying, and these are things we should talk about. And so I am explaining all that because one, the way Reeves and Nass, his research was initially presented was, Here's what we're finding is that this time in the late 80s, I think, was when this research was done, uh, especially in American culture, because I believe everyone involved in their studies were American U.S. students in Stanford, which is typical of research to use your students, right, as a study base. So it's always going to be limited in that way. But um, that... Uh, um, people misinterpret their findings where they were explaining people's expectations that female voices are there to assist you and male voices uh, tend to trigger a response in people uh, that they expect an authoritative setting. They expect, so in other words, if there was um, of a voice system that needed to tell you to get out of the building and you had to listen to it, then they would program that voice as male right? Mm -hmm. it, it, they would say, you know, leave the building now, there's a fire on the fourth floor, it's authoritative, and they want you to move. If they want you to build a relationship with it, then they would program the female voice. And uh, research and development for years, I think, has been a misinterpretation in part because of this Nass and Reeves work, where people said, oh, they found that people have these expectations. Well, first of all, the foundation of their research and their findings still relevant, as I've already explained, but it's a misinterpretation to say they're explaining what they found in the culture and therefore it's a truth. It's not a truth. It was they, what they were doing on purpose was taking a snapshot of the culture at that time and reporting it really in a sociological way and saying, this is what people believe now. Right, and so others still feel the wave of that, like forty yeah. years later. And it's not all their fault because it's not their fault. The only part that's their fault is when people cite their work and they misinterpret it. Because again, they were reporting on how people inter uh, interact with gender in general, especially at that time. Right, uh, we see that changing now. We see attitudes changing now. We see language changing now. There's so many more words for gender um, throughout languages. Of course, I, I'm speaking from a highly Americanized, uh, more recent history where we tend to think of gender up until recently as a binary. We didn't think of gender in a very fluid way at all. And all of that is changing very rapidly. And so projects like Q or a gender neutral voice, I think are an important option for a, a lot of people for a lot of reasons. One is not everybody as a user wants to hear or expects to hear anymore, like a female voice 
is comforting and a male voice automatically is authoritative. People don't necessarily have that belief system. They might. So give them that option to choose that if they like. If that's your belief system or your preference, just your preference, that's fine. Other people have different preferences. And in some situations, having something gender neutral is also less distracting. But it's also a choice because sometimes, and this is getting into self-extension, a different kind of attachment, we extend and project part of ourselves into the technology. And our, you know, sometimes having a relationship with the technology that's more familiar, for example, if you identify as a more non-binary or fluid gender person, you might find this non-binary or gender unrecognizable voice more comforting for yourself or less distracting, you know, uh, for you to get the functionality out of the program. So there's a lot of reasons I think we should transition to more options in the voice. And that's both based on a, a more accurate and more current representation of the research and to adjust to our changing culture. And again, I think it what it does is it's feeding into cultural stereotypes in I don't think a very productive way because we're talking about emerging technologies, right? So again, you can't have it both ways in the industry. Unfortunately, you can't have it both ways in a lot of industries, but you can't say we're going to essentially build on people by emotionally manipulating them by having a gendered voice because we think they're going to respond a certain way in a situation, but then not change it over time as culture shifts because it's an emerging technology. They want to do this bleeding edge cutting edge thing, but they're not keeping up with the culture. And culture now is becoming increasingly more accepting of non-binary as an idea, of gender fluidity as an idea, and they're also not attaching that same primacy to the gendered stereotypes. So you can't as easily say, everyone will react to a woman's voice this way, everyone will react to what's a male voice that way. Yeah, I guess the main problem usually is if there is something like a default way in the system and you can change it. Uh, the very moment you have the possibility to to customize it, like like you, you change the color of your of your uh, desktop environment or something like that, then you don't have a big problem because if you really want to change it, then you change it. But I guess yeah, the main problem is if people a are not capable of changing it, like. Okay how many how many people never change the background color in in their windows operating system because they just can't do it i think that is the, the next step of like how how media savvy or how software or or app savvy you are i guess yeah there's also the fact that we use uh voices everywhere in technology. And I, I've used this example before too, uh, because this comes to mind all the time for me. And that's, for example, uh, in London in the two, Mind the Gap. The Mind the Gap voice is, has been a woman for yeah. years, right? Yeah. Very famous persona. If you've ever written the tube, you're going to recognize the woman's voice who says Mind Gap. So you're careful when you get on and off the train. You don't trip and fall. In fact, I think if you were to take it away or change it, there would probably be an initial outcry because that voice has become intrinsically part of London culture, right? Yeah. So it's got a different valence. It's got a different set. People expect not just a woman's voice, but that specific voice, right? And they, and they expect a woman's voice in that situation. But that is a situation that also illustrates you have no control as, as the user, as the person listening. Right now, I don't get to control what gender voice I hear in the overhead. Maybe 20 yeah. years from now, I'll have the ability, I can tap something in my ear, I can do a preference on my phone or whatever. And any voice I hear in a system is going to be whatever I want. But right now, I can't change mind the gap, right? And that's just sort of one example of how voice is everywhere around us. And, and even if you're, you can just take it for granted how often gendered voice, um, we've come to internalize and accept 
these roles, you know, how often do people think, oh, it's a woman's voice and she's very kind and she sounds encouraging, you know, um, it would be much scarier, I think, traditionally, historically, if it had been a man's voice that people associate with something authoritarian. If you heard that a hundred times a day while waiting for the two, mind the gap, mind the gap, mind the gap. See, some of that's tone as well, right? So that's not necessarily gender, but people associate, again, if they've historically associated gender with it, I can see where in the past they went to the female voice, the more comforting voice, the less stressful voice, right? The less authority, what they thought was gonna be less authoritarian, um, but culture changes, right? So how, how do we change to reflect that? And I think people like myself who work in industry really need to look at how we're part of replicating these gendered ideas and what we're really, who we're really helping and who we're designing for and what ideas we're encouraging when we do something like that. Mm -hmm. So if we look back in the, the history of AI research and cybernetics and, and robotics, uh, most of the money in the 20th century, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, came from, from the military. A lot of, a lot of, lot of like, AI research was funded just like by DARPA or, or, or similar international organizations. Uh, in the meantime, there is a shift because the big, the big four or five or six, you know, like Apple and Facebook and uh, you name them, they are more now uh, like the, the, the entities who invest a lot of money and a lot of research in that kind of stuff because they simply can use that technology. Like Amazon, they're, they're super motivated to get uh, robots uh, to replace their workforce because it's just cheaper for them or easier to handle. And uh, so could you give us kind of like a brief, um, like um, maybe what were the benchmarks, let's call it, in the last, let's say, 100 years of AI research or robot, yeah. robot research? So how did we get up where we are now, where there is a big company like Amazon trying to replace the workforce uh, in a certain way that was the same like a hundred years ago, I guess, but it was just like not possible yet. Uh, so, uh, but for all our listeners out there who don't have any idea about the history of robotics, maybe you could give us like a brief summary, let's call it. Yeah. So, I mean, boy, a brief, a brief, any <laughs> really difficult for me, but I'll give it a go. We have I'm, time. We have time. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take it back. I'm laughing at myself that I can't do anything briefly in an answer. So it, uh, it's because you ask great questions that are really complicated to answer. So I'm going to go back and acknowledge for all the nerds out there that automata have been around for centuries. But they, and what those were, were not necessarily intelligent, but somewhat autonomous robotic like dolls, really. The mechanical dolls, we'd call them now, that could do <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's, they go back hundreds of years in different cultures around the world, but clearly they weren't intelligent, but they were robotic, but they were also only available. Usually they were commissioned by very wealthy people or they were only seen by people at royal courts, etc. So even the idea of automata existing, they weren't on display at museums. They weren't available often for public until later for public discourse. So um, yes, but then to get to where you were saying uh, military is uh, internationally will often be at the cutting edge of any emerging technology research. They're always going to be very invested, not just for weaponization of a research, though certainly that is a motivation, right? Um, but for things like reconnaissance or things like um, uh, keeping soldiers safer uh, is, is one set of reasoning behind it by keeping them at a distance from direct danger. Uh, and we see that really that idea has played out again historically since the beginning of time with 
military research and technology in general. As far as robotics go, there's a, it, I'll speak to American military robotics because that's in my wheelhouse specifically. Really interesting assortment of robots that you can get information on. So when I did my research, I also submitted um, a handful of Freedom of Information Act requests, FOIA requests, um, about different robot projects where I could find the name of the robots and their basic functionality out there, but I would get the runaround for the Freedom of Information Act requests. So certainly there are projects out there that we may never or for a long time be aware of what their goals were or what they accomplished, if anything. Um, uh, but it's certainly the information that is available, there is a wide variety of robots. For example, Manny was a robot that at least they say in theory was, uh, this was interesting because I believe, let's see, Manny was in the 1950s, so very early, I believe he was in the 1950s. I've only ever seen still pictures of it, but apparently it, it was human-like on purpose so it looked very much like a human in its morphology or its shape. It was able to walk, which if you think about the time frame, was very early. Mm -hmm. It could apparently walk in a bipedal manner, which again, if true, is, is was decades before we saw it happen in industry, though it was tethered at the time. And the mm, Defense Department says that the purpose of this was to stress test uh, uniforms and gear and and things that soldiers would wear over time. So in other words, ah. that robot would wear this gear that was protective. And just like walk, walk, walk. And, walk, ah, walk, walk, yeah. right, exactly. And I believe that that could be part of what the robot was created for. But I think it would be very naive to think that they spent all the money and time in this fascinating accomplished project and that that was the only thing that they were using it for though yeah I can't be sure but there were other similar very advanced robots then of course there are all of the technologies that feed into AI there are and to robots in general ro uh, radar lidar things that help the robot uh, determine where it is in relation to other objects and things in the world around it. All of these technologies uh, bloom out of military funding. They have the money usually to do it and explore these things first, right? Before, before it trickles down, usually often the way it works, then it trickles down to maybe academia or industry or industry and then academia and then general public awareness. So that's just one example um, of robots that we know of that were developed and were way more advanced. And I, you know, you wouldn't know of unless you know you you really dug into the history of defense and robotics. So, uh, is there has there been research about? For example, someone someone is doing research about, or, or like like the 1950s, 1950s, 1960s. Yeah. Uh, people want to to create uh, robots or interested in robot uh, research. How is the feedback loop between popular culture and what people think about robots? What like like the fictional robots and how that manifested in real robots, or is it the other way around? <laughs> no, I, I think you're. You're right. It, and, you know, I said earlier, that's always going to be a loop. And I'm writing a whole book about that human gaze perspective, how it relates to us, because, you know, again, they say in theory, right, that this is developed, this robot was developed not just for art, not art for art's sake, right? This wasn't just for intellectual curiosity. They at least admit to one set of functionality that they needed in this robot, which was testing this gear um, and, and, and possibly other things. But um, if what you're asking me is how how did like this human gaze, how did our expectations inform the building of the robot? Um, even just the fact that somebody thought to build this human-like robot, right, was probably, and even use the word robot, was informed by like, look, look at the play RUR, the Czechoslovakian play in the 1920s that introduced the term robota, 
right? Uh, it was a Czechoslovakian word by the author Karl Čepek and a play that he had written about, uh, now we'd call them cyborgs. In his book, he called them robota. He coined the term, or he and his brother did, there's some debate there, coined the term robota. And what he, and it was uh, a metaphor for fascism, for authoritarianism, for our relationship with uh, for uh, democracy versus communism was he was writing at the mm -hmm. time as a criticism of that because the humans had created this robotic class to be slaves, to be enslaved. And uh, you see that power dynamic, whether you want to call it enslavement, which is um, debatable in itself because we're not talking about humans, we're talking about machines, but we're also talking about that power dynamic where we're creating machines to function in some ways as a replacement for us, especially in dangerous, dirty, or repetitive situations, right? Um, and so again, this wasn't art for art's sake. It wasn't for intellectual curiosity. It was specifically to help people, supposedly. So they clearly took the idea of robots and robotics had to have been influenced whether they knew it directly or not by science fiction and by a history of automata, uh, which was art for art's sake, really. Um, and so clearly art has an influence on science and then science and the realities of science has cultural impact. And then that's that loop. It just it never ends, right? Art and science, art and science. So, yeah. at least in my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, if I if I look at at kind of like, let's say the nerds of my generation, because I was born nineteen seventy five, and all the people of my generation uh, who were nerds and first being you know like were beaten up in the schoolyard and now now running the planet. I mean, that is that is that specific time frame, and it's interesting to see that. Uh, if you look at what's going on now and what the big tech companies are doing and even the big robot researchers, most of that stuff, or at least a big part of it, is inspired by all the cultural products that me and those other people consumed in the 70s and 1980s. So okay. at some point, of course, Robocop is a very good example. Robocop is a super brilliant satire about regonomics and Thatcherism. Yeah. And, and uh, it's not a blueprint of how the future should look like, but right. some people just like took it as a blueprint because it's a, it would be so cool to have a Robocop. Uh, no, the point of the film was there should never be a Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but of course it's so cool. <laughs> there is that cool factor. There is that, that unfortunately, is in my opinion, and I'm going to say unfortunately because it's presented as business and not, let me explain. There is a time where it things I believe should be art for art's sake and an exploration of intellectual curiosity. The problem in my opinion, re relevant to what you're saying is when people get confused about their influences and go to throwbacks uh, like we were saying earlier with voice, for example, with gender technology. So we're talking about, I'm not going to pick on the, the people who directly, I'm not going to name names, but there was a company, there uh, two young men who, and I, I think it was European based. I, I honestly don't remember what country offhand. It may have been the UK, but they had developed a robot named Rosie after the robot in the Jetsons cartoon, which if, you, if you're under 50, you may not even know the Jetsons, but the Jetsons were a very popular cartoon, especially in the United States that took place in the future. And they had- It was like the future version of the Flintstones pretty much. Yes, it yeah. was, That's a, exactly. You've exactly got it. It was like a future version. They were building on popularity of the Flintstones, right? And it was actually a spinoff, I believe, of the Flintstone. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a fun fact, but- uh, uh, yeah, so and they had a maid named Rosie, right, who was a robot. And I believe that was it. They had other robots in it. But anyway, so there's that power dynamic again, where they actually had the servant was the robot, right? The servant was a female robot. The servant was a female robot dressed as a maid 
traditionally at the time. So a little frilly hat, little frilly apron. And then here we have, it was within the last 10 years, two young men referring to Rosie the robot and naming their as their inspiration for creating a robot maid and then naming this robot Rosie and they got investors for it and they got to a certain point with this robot. And it's not the only robot I've seen named Rosie, right? Um, and, uh, and every time this Rosie robot is developed, it's gendered female and its role, its functionality is to assist in the home and essentially take over roles traditionally done by women often, which are domestic chores. So to get to circle back to what you were saying, we're again, we're replicating, we're still replicating, we're taking emerging technologies and sometimes we're replicating these old cultural ideas like having a robot that's gendered female to clean up after you, right? One of the criticisms of Silicon Valley in the Bay Area right now is that often the technology ideas come from, uh, this is widely said, it's a, it's a joke around here that, you know, um, it's young men often coming up with ideas of ways to automate chores that their mothers did previously. Yeah. And so we have a that lot makes of- makes a lot of sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it does, unfortunately. There, there is a cultural truth to that joke because a lot of the decisions in R and D, especially in the Bay Area, are still made by men. And a lot of these projects are probably funded, um, especially through venture cap capital funding, because uh, of this. That perspective is still widely that patriarchal viewpoint is still widely unquestioned and often unquestioned by um, people who want to invest and just think, is it investable? Not necessarily, they're not necessarily thinking about the ram of the cultural ramifications of reproducing gender bias, right? They're just going, is this investable? Does it work? And so, yeah, it's, a, in my opinion, it's, it's a real, it's a problem. And it's one that the whole industry really needs to not only examine, but fix. Yeah, and the, but the question is like, how is that fixable? Because I mean, the whole the whole general culture, you know, like of venture capital and and uh, uh, pretty much like uh, uh, the, the whole the whole idea of like that you invest like five five years of your time into creating a startup and then selling it to the highest bidder. Uh, not caring what happens with it afterwards because that that's how they plan their lifestyle. Well, uh, there's something inherently uh, toxic about all of that. Yeah. yeah, it is. And how how do you fix that problem? You know, so a lot of people come back to answer that question, and and this is true. And they'll say things like, "You need to have diverse set of voices. You need to have a diverse set of ideas. It can't just be feeding into this." patriarchal, historically patriarchal set of ideas, right? You have to expand your mind. Well, how do you do that? You don't just have interdisciplinary teams. You don't just have teams that are purposely bringing different people's experiences and ideas to the table, but you have to listen to those viewpoints and incorporate them. And that's a lot of times too, where especially again, I'll speak for the Bay Area because that's where I'm situated. That's a lot of times where we fail in research and development. We talk a good game uh, about diversity and, and having all kinds of voices at the table, right? But what really happens is even when those voices are invited, we don't place a primacy on them or we don't listen often because that would have that would take effort. We would have to navigate new ways of thinking. We might have to start fresh with some of our ideas. It might take longer, which is depth to a project because there's always a temporal component in getting things to market out here, right? It's much easier to shorthand a project idea and say, it's like Rosie the robot, get it? Yeah. It's like she's going to pick up after you, get it? And somebody gets it, 
than to say, we actually did a lot of research. What people want is something gender neutral. We've developed a, a, this robot. It, 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 its name is XPQ. It doesn't have a particular gender assigned to it. You know, it, so XPQ cleans around the house. And then they have to explain the whole idea behind XPQ. And people don't want to invest the time in hearing yeah. the reasoning. People don't want to, it's so much easier to not navigate these issues and yeah, a product needs an, a narrative and if it if, if the narrative is easier to sell because you know like like rosie the maid is the perfect example it's such an easy narrative uh to sell to someone but at the same time it's super damaging <laughs> yeah, exactly and you know it's not uh you know, if somebody has been raised, especially, I'm going to say, uh, uh, let's say culture of engineering and engineering schools in the United States. And as you mentioned, nerdism has taken off in the last 50 years and the nerds rule the world. And often when we say nerds, we're referring not just to social scientists like myself, but we're referring to engineers. And engineers in, in lots of different kinds of engineering have become rock stars right and have earned lots of money um and Elon Musk, perfect example i mean right and they you, develop you, you, you can't get even you can't get any closer to like like what you know like stark in the marvel universe is is kind of like elon musk is i'm i'm almost astounded how how far he will go now <laughs> but i mean that's part of his brand i guess well, it is. And look, we worship Iron Man, right? I mean, Iron Man, we love Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man in movies, right? I'm going to bring it back to movies the way I always yeah. do. But what is he? He was a military contractor. Why are we so empathetic towards this guy who was a military contractor? But we love him because it's Robert Downey Jr. And, you know, there's a whole term for that, right? In popular culture, this whole fanboy thing. And why is it mm -hmm. called fanboy generally uh, for people like Elon Musk? Again, it goes back to this patriarchal sense, people jumping in to defend his ideas because it's frankly, in my opinion, easier because it fits their own narrative. It fits their ideas. It fits their expectations, right? Uh, and people are very eager to jump on that. They're like, this person who's really smart and has been rewarded with a lot of money for his ideas, when in reality, this particular example, we know he inherited a lot of money through a lot of unethical familial practices, right? that go back to enslavement, frankly, and yeah. unequal power dynamics, right? Yeah, like South um, Africa, yeah. Exactly, in South Africa. So uh, it's amazing who we choose to worship and, and follow in a popular sense. Of course, I'm incredibly biased as a, that social science geek who doesn't get necessarily listened to, who's always like the one yelling and advocating and for people and say, no, let's step back and think about it. But, you know, having so having that interdisciplinary, having someone like me involved is good, but you also have to then listen to a voice like mine. Yeah. Having minority representation, whether it's women, people of color, you know, gender diversity, uh, interdisciplinariness, and the Venn diagram of all of those things that could pop potentially overlap in a person. Yeah, have those and have us involved, but you also have to apply what we say. And that's the harder part, in my opinion, especially in the Bay Area. You can put on a happy face and you can hire all the user experience people or social science people or whatever, you know, you can have a, a face Google famously uh, has an issue recently with um, a, a black uh, ethicist there who published a study they didn't like and then essentially made a hostile work environment for her. You have to listen to people that are pointing out things that are coming down the pike culturally. And if for no other reason, if you don't care about humanity, if you don't care about people, if you don't care about culture, if you're focused on business and the product and investability, guess what? Your product's not going to have the longevity or the acceptance even maybe that you predict if you don't incorporate 
these ideas that say, this is what's happening in culture and this is what's coming down the pike. So even if for no other or coming, you know, coming at you as a cultural pattern, like people being more accepting to gender fluidity is the example. Um, so yeah, you have to listen. Yeah. And I mean, that's always astounding to me is like, I don't get it why people are so uh, argumentative about all this stuff, especially if they are very conservative and they are coming from a business side. Those people are all possible customers. Why do you alienate your customers? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm a super duper leftist about, but I, I, I just don't get it from that perspective. Why? <laughs> I, I believe me, I, I've been doing this for, uh, you know, 25 plus years in one form or another. You know, starting in the film theory, transitioning to human computer interaction, where I really saw the beginning of, of what you're saying and then the human robot interaction and more generally how humans interact with technology. And I'm sad to say that it hasn't changed much, though I, I am happy we're talking about having a diverse set of voices and interdisciplinary voices involved. That's great that we're finally getting to that place in conversation. But like you, I am gobsmacked. I am amazed. I have tried that argument over and over again in industry. Um, it globally, when I'm called on to consult, and, and frequently people will hire people like me. Uh, they may genuinely want my opinion. Sometimes I think it's almost just for show to say we had a social scientist because I don't feel very effective, to be honest, advocating for the user by the end. If they don't incorporate my ideas or my warnings or uh, my guidelines or my suggestions, why hire expert voices you know, that are from this diverse set of experiences if you're not going to apply them. It's only going to make you, as exactly like you said, if for no other reason you're alienating audiences, it it, it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, potential, uh, potential, not only that, sometimes potential really loyal audiences. Sometimes, yeah. for example, you could alienate, you know, Uh, uh, gay people with a representation or women or a minority group and potentially they could be some of your biggest uh, promoters yeah. really if you're going to talk about business can be some of the most historically loyal consumers yeah. over time and especially like in times of social media when it, it's pretty much it's all about attention economy Yep. Uh, and you don't want to get the bad attention. I mean, I mean, of course, like there is, uh, like th there is no bad attention. Let's say it like that. But I mean, nobody really wants to 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 to, to get a shitstorm if they can avoid it. I mean, yeah, you would think, right? You would yeah. think, but they're often thinking short term, and short term even include, you know, they just want the funding, or they want the project done or they want to be first to market or a combination of all of these things because first to market, as we all know, is very important. Um, it's important for a lot of reasons in releasing a product and it unfortunately rules what ideas are getting put into the world. Let's let's step into a completely different world because now we're talking about uh, the world of you know like investment capital and and uh, and and kind of like open research but also kind of like business. Mm -hmm. uh, the world of military is completely different. Yeah. I assume I'm not yeah. sure. I, I I don't know anything about the diversity in military research. But I mean that's not the point. I guess <laughs> nobody really knows who does what research there because I mean you can probably like look some of that stuff up but not. A lot of it, but so if you compare uh, the world, the, the pretty public world, let's call it, of Silicon Valley, and the pretty private world of military research, uh, and there is still, I mean, if you just like look at the numbers, how much money is is being invested every year in military research is just like mind blowing, and most of it is black money. You don't even know it. it it's just it's not even open what they are funding with it, but. Uh, But it's very interesting for someone like me because, of course, you know, like military robots are cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of that stuff out there, you, you never really know what is really happening, what not. They keep most of it a secret. So, so 
what, what is the state of the art in military robotics right now? Just like yeah. a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Another, I, actually, I would uh, so, okay. Again, uh, yeah, simple question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to I mean, start. It's me like a blah 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 blah, no, and I actually no. only want to know what is the state of what is the state of the art of military research and robotics right now. Yeah. Okay. So there are so many things to talk about there. One is so you're right in that it's not very diverse. The military in general. Again, I'm going to speak to the U.S. military, mm -hmm. U.S. defense, because that's what I know personally. Is, is the most. And also I should point out that my research was not military funded. Okay. It was funded by the National Science Foundation here. So I didn't take any, you know, and that wasn't because I wanted to get the military or catch them at anything. It was for mostly the reasons that we talked about, which was that they were early in some processes. And I wanted to talk about what was happening sociologically and culturally early with certain kinds of robots. So I wasn't out to get them, but let's put that. So what is the state of it? Unfortunately, uh, it's still very patriarchal. It's still white male dominated, cis male dominated, as far as what's obvious, like you said, as far as what we know, as far as the researchers whose names we know of, uh, who's make their lives accessible in ways that we can know these things about them. There's still not a lot of social science involved, a handful of researchers that I could name. Um, and frankly, who have been the same researchers in charge for decades, which is of that particular area, which is good and bad. Great, because they're clearly experts in their area, perhaps bad because I would like to see some new voices brought in for the reasons we said before, for you need all kinds of demographics involved in bringing in new ideas and, and concepts to the table. Um, what is the state of it today? I will say that in my opinion, the Office of Naval Research has a history of doing more broad, at least public facing research about the human interaction part with robots, including how people will interact socially with robots, if at all, and whether that's going to impede or help uh, people interacting with them, soldiers interacting with them, and have at least paid some sort of attention to that and incorporating that. And they have some well-known facilities for testing robots, not just, again, their functionality, but their interaction. So I know that the Office of Naval Research I think is better about that than some of the other branches of the military. Um, certainly, you know, I'm, I'll pick on the U.S. Army is sort of famous for releasing technology and not having and or having very little consideration for things like how is this technology traumatizing soldiers long term, if at all? How are they interacting with it? at a social level and how does that impact them, if at all? You know, how does loss of a robot you may be attached to impact your decision making or your trust of that system uh, in the moment or the situation? Uh, again, sort of like business outcomes, even if you didn't care about the people, the humans, the soldiers, you should care in the military about the robot being used the way you intended it in its functionality and not impeding things like trust and adoption of the system and soldier decision-making because right now we're still talking about humans in the loop where humans have to make decisions. We are, let's talk about autonomy, moving in many ways towards autonomous weapons. There are a lot of people, especially in academia, but also in industry, who are speaking out at UN levels against autonomous weapons and lobbying very hard against autonomous weapons. I would put myself in the anti-autonomous weapons group. Um, AI is not there. And I, uh, to make contextual decisions to understand the nuances of things before it blows people away. It We're just not there and it, AI, I don't care what the military is doing, frankly, what I know of or don't know of, there should be a human in the loop before anybody considers wiping out other humans with yeah. a tool. And also, war is never fair. 
Yeah. But we're talking about who has the money for robots and these high tech weapons then versus who doesn't. Can you imagine the power imbalance if a country has autonomous weapons and other countries don't, you know, and, and that's even not autonomy, even just the semi-autonomous weaponry. The fact that we're moving towards this weaponization of AI um, is not cool, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But even just like a simple task as, uh, because it, it's a popular image, you know, like the big dog, you know, like uh, Boston Dynamics. I'm not, I think they sold it to someone else. Like who actually owns the big dog now? Is it the military? Yeah, that's a great question. Boston Dynamics is notoriously secretive, yeah. uh, um, even within the industry. I mean, I will talk to colleagues uh, and they're, you know, we're all like, do you know anyone that works there? I don't know anyone that, you know, like we, none of us can get inside her information. They must have very good non-disclosure yeah. agreements as well. But they, yes, they've had military contracts, right? So, um, and, and I, I frankly don't know who owns Boston Dynamics right now, what the situation is, because they have passed hands several times. Yeah. But yeah, they, they're being sold and versions of their robots are being sold to surveil people in civilian life now. They're being mm -hmm. sold to police departments. Oh. They're being sold as security. They're being yeah. sold as tools for police. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a problem, whether they're weaponized or not. We've seen a recent history of that uh, with an EOD robot, explosive ordnance disposal robot, which is a robot, as you know, that I specifically researched for my book, where people interacting with explosive ordnance disposal robots. What's interesting about these robots to me is they don't look like people, they don't look like animals, but sometimes the soldiers treated them like that. That's a different thing, treating them like social actors. What I'm talking about is in our recent history, because civilian police departments do often use EOD robots for surveillance and to disarm and uh, to defuse unexploded ordnance. Like, let's say grandpa has a hand grenade in the attic that he brought back from Vietnam, right? And someone the robot goes down there. Exactly. Or, uh, well, there was an incident in Texas a few years ago where a civilian police uh, department brought in the robot. There was a shootout, unfortunately, because this is the United States. The person was had a history of mental illness, they had access to a gun, several police officers were shot, civilians were in danger, they, the police themselves couldn't stop them. So what did they do? They took this EOD robot, which is not weaponized, it's mm -hmm. meant for surveillance and meant to be used as a tool, that was its intended functionality. But what they did was they, you know, they jury rigged it, they changed it on the fly, they strapped plastic explosives to it, Oh. They sent the robot out to the shooter and blew it up on purpose where it effectively was weaponized and killed the shooter. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to get into even a whole conversation about excessive force and everything because the deal is, is there was there was no policy in place that they couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. right? So in the police's mind, they're dealing with an immediate urgent situation and trying to resolve it and prevent further mass injury and yeah. shooting. So what they were doing was probably creative problem solving in their minds, right? But the outcome was they weaponized something that wasn't intended to be weaponized. And if they could do it, and I, they've been pretty quiet about, I haven't heard police departments have big discussions then about policy change or education of officers about when this might be acceptable or when it's not, it hasn't seemed to spark any conversation that I'm aware of outside of the police uh, community. Yeah. But I've been paying attention to it because clearly yeah. it's in my wheelhouse um, and I may have missed something, but um, it didn't spark the controversy or the policy changes I hoped. So that's a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's it's strange that I haven't heard about that case because I'm usually a very a, like like a nerd for that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's uh, very interesting. So 
it so it it's it, it it's an interesting answer to my question because uh, it seems that those machines are not really used yet to kill people, but they are. <laughs> well, the history of EOD robots, to get into a quick yeah. history of robots in the military, yeah. which is impossible because there's so many kinds yeah. of robots that the military has used, but EOD robots had, I mean, they've changed over the years. So one reason I did speak to EOD was because they were perhaps the first, perhaps the first, but certainly the most consistent um, it's called mission of service or job within the military that has used robots consistently for decades. So I was really interested in talking to them and their robots have changed over time. And one of the ways was there was a period where the robots they used were huge. They were tank-like. There was a time where the robots they used were weaponized, but then they decided that's not really part of the job of EOD. The, the mission of service or job of EOD is purely to make people safer to diffuse unexploded ordnance. And, you know, so that's their role, right? So they took the weaponization off the robots. And I think that was a good set of decisions in, in many ways. Um, we don't need more weaponized anything, right? In a yeah. perfect world, right? Um, so now they're not weaponized. So that's the history of it. But then we see it came full circle in civilian use when they had to make a decision and there was no clear policy involved, they weaponized it in, in the Texas case. So, yeah. you know, uh, so- Yeah, but in, in general, the US has a long history of like taking military equipment and using it uh, in, in, in the police force. So, uh, yeah. In fact, many times the military will donate, in this case, used EOD robots. They donate them to the civilian police forces uh, to be helpful, uh, to develop partnerships. And many times the people that use uh, the robots in the civilian police form may have had some EOD training or military background themselves. But many times they have not. So, uh, and it's, uh, I've had trouble personally, even as a professional researcher in this area, uh, accessing information of what kind of training the civilian police actually get for interacting with these robots. What is their education? And what are the policies, if any, in place? And how have they changed since the Texas uh, incident, if at all? So yeah, that's, that's a problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is this old like cyberpunk slogan that the street will find uh, a use for technology, yeah. but that's probably not the use that we're all hoping for, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's that, again, that's an extreme example, but uh, people will, uh, it's not an unusual one. We change technology all the time. We're used to it. We customize it. Uh, you said at the beginning, talked about changing, I mean, even your screensaver. We are so used to customizing our technology now. Even automated windows rolling down a window in a car. You know, we're so used to, that's a, a form of us changing our environment to suit us. We're so used to customizing technology to suit our end goals that I think that that gets in the way of, again, you know, I, I'm not trying to make these police officers, I'm not trying to paint them as evil. I think that there's a big gap in their education and understanding, but I also think that that's not fair to them. I think that they made a decision that they felt at the time was going to result in the safety of the most people. Mm -hmm. And they felt they had a tool that could be used to stop further violence. But that's a very different philosophy, as you said, than why that robot was developed. But it's a great example of how people change technology to suit their needs all the time. Yeah. <sighs> Maybe one last question because we could go on for hours, but yeah. uh, let let let's stick let's stick to the to the military uh, perspective or, or or the military research uh, about robotics. Okay. So I know that is kind of like you know, like your personal micro science fiction story now. But where do you see uh, military robotics in let's say five to ten years? 
will there be the future that we all see on, you know, like Black Mirror, for example, and other uh, TV programs where you see you know, like autonomous robots running around in Iraq uh, and we don't need uh, uh, the soldiers anymore because we have robots who do that job and probably speak better Arabic than, than most uh, US soldiers. Uh, is this like a real chance that that will happen, or uh, or or what? Uh, well, let's say what would happen. What would it, what would it need to happen to stop that? Kind of like yeah. something like a, like an international treaty for the ban of uh, AI robots or something. I don't know. I mean, we have that for nuclear weapons in auto space. So I don't know. Yeah. So that's why we have people working at the UN level in, in AI and ethics to stop autonomous weapons, um, uh, which is certainly a group that I pay attention to and, and, and follow. I'm not, uh, no one invites me to the UN level of discussions yet. So I haven't participated, but I certainly follow those discussions. But uh, yeah, so uh, is your question that, that you asked me, I think, like three questions in that one. Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, the question is like, is it realistic? Is, <laughs> let, let's rephrase it. I mean, is it realistic that we will have autonomous, uh, uh, like, military robots in like five to ten years that actually do service? Uh, and I guess the second question was like, what would we need to do to stop that if it happens? <laughs> so I think that what we need to also, let's talk about language here again, is understand the difference between autonomy and sentience, right? Mm -hmm. So autonomy means it can act making its own series of decisions that are right now and in the foreseeable for short future, five to 10 years, going to be algorithmic. I don't care what Elon Musk or anybody else says. It's going to be algorithmic for a long period of time because cultural context is the holy grail in AI because it doesn't understand the human perspective. It cannot make nuanced decisions based on an understanding of how humans live in the world, right? And that goes for whether it's a voice system in your home that doesn't really understand you to an autonomous weapon, right? I'm gonna keep using my, my raptor claws here, yeah. autonomous. It's not sentient, it's not intelligent in the way a human mind is. It doesn't have self-awareness. It doesn't have awareness of others, right? And it's not thinking in a nuanced way about human behavior and cannot make decisions based on human behavior. So for example, I'll give, I'll give a, a horrific example of a potential use of an autonomous versus a sentient weapon here, okay? So let's say you had an autonomous drone and it was following a suspected terrorist and its assignment was to uh, eradicate this particular terrorist. And it was about to do so because that was its mission. I'm simplifying this in, in a gross way to make an example. And that terrorist though was also has a life as a person was dropping their child off at school. And that's when the drone decides to eradicate this terrorist and perhaps injure school children as well. It, so not only, so yeah, did it achieve its goal in a horrific way? Yes. Was there other collateral damage like children in this imaginary situation? Yeah. You know, because the AI isn't going to understand that nuance. Uh, and again, that's oversimplified, a gross example. But those are the kinds of things people are worried about. And I think that police example can give you a very real understanding of what happens when policy isn't in place. So yeah, there needs to be policy, in my opinion, at state and federal and international levels. How do I see robotics going? Increasingly autonomous, unfortunately, because again, we're looking at things through our human gaze. How can robots and how can AI serve us, right? That's often, and how can they be a substitute, if not a replacement for us? How can they substitute for us in, in situations like this? Um, I don't see, I, I think Black Mirror is an excellent program. I wish they'd come back for another season. A lot of their shows are based in technologies and realities that have been ideas that have been put out there that are being developed. So that's scary for me as a researcher. Um, I love seeing how they creatively explore the ethical problems, 
right? Of, I mean, really, how could I not love the narrative of their exploring, you know, sort of all of these things that I think about all the time? Of course, I'm going to be a Black Mirror fan, right? Yeah. Um, where do I see it going in terms of functionality? In EOD in particular, something I personally saw was more teleoperation. And so that relieves the robot of having to be so smart and so it's, it's kind of like remote control, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's remote, but often it will be in the shape, especially for EOD robots, because so EOD, one of the biggest problems they face in unexploded ordnance are IEDs, improvised explosive devices in modern warfare. IEDs are something that they deal with. The difference between, and this is all relevant, trust me, I'll get there. IEDs are crucially different than something like a mine because they are improvised. That means that they are made by human hands in individualized circumstances. And often, whereas a mine is mass produced, okay? Yeah. So you could choose a bunch of algorithms for the best way to diffuse a mine based on what you know of that mine's production. IEDs can take so many insidious forms and often they're put together by human hands. So they need to be disabled by something that functions similarly to a human hand, whether it's a claw or even better if it has fingers or if it can move in a human-like space because IEDs are often partly emotional traumatic warfare are placed in places where they're going to do the most damage to people, yeah. right? So that means they're put in spaces meant for humans, like let's say a market space that's meant for a human to walk around in. So it makes sense then, not just for the EOD robot to uh, be remotely operated to keep the soldier at a safer distance uh, while they try to diffuse it, but for it to have a human-like shape and human-like hands so it can move in the market space, which was designed for humans, and so it can effectively diffuse it. And so that means that often these teleoperated robots are being developed that are human-like in shape, at least to some degree. And that's where, again, we see things like maybe the Atlas robot, maybe from Boston Dynamics or other similar robots that are being developed and deployed. So yeah, it might keep soldiers safer in some situations. Uh, but again, we're talking about specifically human-like robots. That's going to be a whole other set of interaction issues, especially from my perspective. Um, and I have an interest in, again, how they treat robots as social actors. Something else that we treat robots, uh, EOD soldiers often treated robots as an extension of their physical self. You see that in gaming, right? Yeah, you can yeah. attach to your avatar because it's an extension of yourself in a digital space, right? To some level, it's yeah. an extension of your actions, your behaviors, maybe even what you look like. And people have been known, not always, but to become attached to their avatars because they're identifying with it in that digital space, extending their physical self in a digital space. Similarly, people, I saw EOD soldiers extend themselves sometimes into the robots, not only referring to it as a social actor, but operators specifically would say the robot is an extension of me at a distance. It's my arms. It's my eyes at a distance. It's me. And other soldiers could recognize who was operating the robot by the tactics that oh, it took. Yeah. Which does, was, does it happen, for example, that, that people uh, grow fond of their like pet and don't want to send the uh, the robot pet into danger or something like that. Yeah, and we see that not that well. That's interesting too because often the robots, especially in the military, take over the role of either what people would have done previously or what animals have done historically. Canine units, yeah. right? Um, now, as far as I'm aware, there's not a history of canine handlers having an issue with decision making because they're so highly trained, they understand mm -hmm. from the beginning the risks involved. But there is a very interesting debate that happened recently that is also relevant about military canine handlers and how they handle the policy the military had for how to handle the dogs 
after the dogs were retired mm -hmm. because they've been trained for very specific use. And so they generally couldn't just be adopted by anybody. They needed different kinds of socializing. And the dogs were not categorized. There was policy for what do you do with equipment and what do you do with personnel that are retired, right? But there was no policy for the dogs. For and the, the canine dog, personnel, yeah. And the canine personnel became a lobby group and said, no, we need to do, we need a category or they need to be subsumed under the human personnel requirements somehow or something because you can't just like abandon the dogs or just leave them with an adoption agency or hope that another canine handler adopts them. There has to be policies in place. Look at the history of, of animals in warfare, elephants, dogs, dolphins we see in a modern yeah, yeah. way. So it, your, your instinct is correct. Um, yeah. It's not just because we're re replacing or substituting human roles, but also the role of sometimes animals, which also can trigger attachment. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we really have to stop. We are way over time, but it was it's, it's, it's wonderful. But maybe you could give us some hints if some of our uh, uh, viewers and listeners want to go into more detail about the research that you're doing. Where should they go online? Yeah, well, if you're that? interested in my research in particular, um, boy, I'm I'm uh, I'm not on Instagram, but I am on Twitter at jg carpenter um similarly i'm i've got a website jgcarpenter.com uh where i post about stuff coming up every now and then i have like an ask me anything kind of thing on twitter i haven't done mm -hmm. one lately but i do try to keep myself open to general questions if you have something you can shoot me a dm if you follow and and everything and i i'll try and respond as time allows um, but and maybe if people have questions, like put them, you know, YouTube comment section. Yes, yeah. and exactly right here. Um, yeah, but you can find my work online, and and if you're interested in work beyond my work, you know, I, I cite so many. I've talked about even in this conversation. Look up. I would say look up Reeves and Nass. Go back to. I'm going to say as an academic, go back to computers. The good old 1980s. Yeah, because because that work was really foundational and still affects uh, research and development today, sometimes inaccurately through an accurate interpretation, as I talked about. So I think that that's worth reading and making up your own mind. Thank you so much. A big applause, virtual, uh, over over the over the the big pond from from Vienna to San Francisco. It was great having you. Thank you so much, and I'll definitely keep uh, keep myself updated with all your stuff because I follow you on Twitter and all that stuff, so I know yep. what's what's Why going on. I follow on. you, so thank you, thank you, Johan. Thank it's you so fun. much. <laughs> hey, folks, and dear ladies and gentlemen of whatever gender you prefer, that was another episode of B Three in Depth. If you want to see future episodes, please subscribe somewhere down here. I hope to see you in the future and I hope you join the debate. Thanks. <laughs>